Ephesians chapter 4 this evening, for a few minutes, one more time. Thank you fellows for helping out today, I know it was a big help with the Valentine's uh, thing. Ephesians 4, let's stand, shall we? We'll start in verse 22, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another." tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And shall we pray. Now, Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to gather one more time as fellow believers in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the singing. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony. Thank you, Lord, for the uh, Lord's sword drill, for the offering, for everything that has uh, preceded. And now, Lord, we would pray that you would help us uh, in this place tonight. Lord, I pray that you would bless your word to our hearts. And Lord, that you would encourage us uh, in the few minutes that we have left. Lord, I'm, I, I always think about how quickly our day goes by. Whether we have a dinner or not, whether we meet at night again or not, where the day just seems to go by so rapidly. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to rightly divide it tonight. Help us to get something from it that will help us Lord, that we might be an exhorter, that, Lord, we might help other folks to be edified in our church. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be able to communicate, Lord, one to another. And Lord, that you'll help us that we might genuinely and truly love one another. Now, Lord, again, we thank you for the folks who have come back tonight. Pray for those who could not be here because of sickness. Pray for those, Lord, who could not be here because of work. But, Lord, we're here. And Lord, we really, 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 really do need. Lord, I really would love for you to meet with us in the few minutes that we have tonight. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. A psychologist has estimated, I, I have it written down, that a psychologist estimated that 80% of the problems that people have uh, particularly in marriages, but it could be true in a church, it could be true in a friendship, that 80% uh, of the problems are because people simply do not how, know how to communicate. Uh, I've read that as high as 86% of problems in marriages are simply because people do not know how to communicate with one another. They don't know how to talk to one another. Uh, they just simply don't know how to communicate. It's like the lady that came into the divorce lawyer, and she said, I want a divorce. And he said, well, do you have any grounds? She said, yeah, we've got about 27 acres. He said, no, no. He said, I don't mean that. He said, does he beat you up? No, she said, I'm usually up about a half hour before he is every day. He said, no, no. He said, it does, does, does he have a grudge? She said, no, we just have a carport. You see, the problem is people just don't know how to communicate. You'll get the grudge part, but anyway... Uh, it's, people don't know how to communicate. There are basically, basically five levels that people communicate with. The first one is this, we'll not belabor them very long, but the first one is this, is frivolous talking. That's simply where people come in and they say, did you see the Super Bowl? Uh, what's the weather like? You think it's going to snow? Uh, probably. Uh, you know, did you get your grass cut? Did you get your uh, dog chain out of your snowblower? You know, that's frivolous kind of talk. It's very shallow. 
Most people, when they communicate, that's the kind of communication that they have. The second level is a factual kind of communication. There's nothing personally involved in this kind of talk. There's frivolous talk. There's factual talk. Uh, do you think it's going to get hot? I don't know. But there's, there's really no involvement personally on a one-to-one on -a -one basis, just factual talking. Um, you know that uh, uh, Obamacare is a, is a, is a, is a mess. Uh, well, n yeah, uh, just the facts. Give me the facts about it. Now they want to extend it until 2016 that everybody can keep their own uh, uh, policy. If you like it, you can keep it. It's just factual talking. It's frivolous talking. The next level is that people get up to is, is a factual talking. The, second, the third level is this. It's fellowship talking. It's when people who genuinely, I, I, I hate that word. I, I use it too much. Uh, that when people um, who like one another uh, get around each other, and they talk, and they fellowship, and once in a while, they give an idea. They have an idea, and they share that idea. Um, in a church, when you are together, when we have dinners together, and people fellowship together, and they give out their ideas, uh, they may give out a judgment about something. Uh, I don't like this. I don't, I don't like... Uh, and nobody's ever said this, and if they did, I'd beat them up. Uh, I don't like Mrs. Ward's piano playing. Nobody's ever said that. She's an excellent player. But people give judgments. I don't like the president, you know, uh, whatever, you know. People give judgments. That's fellowship. There's frivolous, silly. Then there's factual. Then there's fellowship. Then there, the, the fourth level of communication is with feeling. It is with feeling. How do you feel? about this what do you what do you think about this when husbands and wives talk what do you think about building an in-ground swimming pool i don't uh, you know you ask about uh uh how, how how are you feeling today and genuinely ask it it's like when i asked peter how are you feeling he said pitiful i said well, what's wrong he said nothing i just got tired of saying i'm feeling good you know it's like we we uh, uh, we, we ask people. Sometimes we ask people, and we just ask them to ask them. Hey, how you? How are you doing? Well, uh, well, let me tell you. How much longer are you going to be telling me? You know, it's like uh, when we get to this fourth level of speaking, when we really communicate our feelings, how we really, really, really feel about it. You know, most men, and I, I, I'm seriously about this, most men, most men never communicate to their wives how they really feel because they really do not want their wives to know how vulnerable they may be. Men rarely, if ever, I'm not saying that they don't. I'm not saying that they do not. Sometimes they do. If you can get to that, if you can get to that level, and it doesn't matter true whether it's in your marriage, uh, or in your home, with your children, um, how you really feel about something. How is it that you really feel? You know, that guy is a no good. He's just a, he's a lying, low down, four flushing hypocrite. Well, why don't you tell me how you really feel about the guy? You know, it, it's like feeling. When we use feeling, when we talk, most people, most people, they may get to the factual. They may get to the They'll get past the frivolous, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing all right. Uh, well, I really didn't want to know anyway. Uh, they get past the frivolous. They may talk with, about something factual. You know, it's like, um, did you see the Super Bowl? Yeah, I see, saw it. What did you think about? What did you, th you think the Patriots would have done a better job than the uh, uh, Broncos would have? Yeah, I think they would have. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. And fellowship. Uh, you get around people, and you just merely, you're talking, and you've gotten beyond the frivolous, you've gotten beyond the factual, but you're fellowshipping one with another. You're having an honest conversation. Most people get to that level. More people, fewer people, get to the feeling level because they really don't want to know, they really don't want people to know how they really feel. 
You know, the Bible says in, in Galatians chapter 6, I'll, I'll just use Alex for a minute if I might. Alex um, might have a problem about something. How do I know that Alex has a problem unless he's willing to talk to me about it? But we don't want people, we don't want to tell people our problems. We, the Bible says confess your faults to one another that you may pray for one another. How can I pray for you? Well, I really don't want anybody to know how I really think, how I really feel. I really don't want people to know my problems. I really don't want them. It's very difficult to get to that feeling stage in communication. But if you're going to communicate with somebody effectively, you've got to be able to, if you'll pardon the expression, let your hair down. You've got to let your hair down and just tell them how it is that you feel. The fifth, the fifth one is this. The fifth level of communication is freedom. Very few people ever get there. Very few ever get there. It is when you are totally, completely honest all about yourself. You know what we're afraid, what we're afraid of, is that people will really find out about us and not love us. There are, we're, we are afraid that if we truly tell people our feelings and confess our faults, Somebody, someone asked me this week, somebody, somebody and, and I don't think, as a matter of fact, I know that we do. Somebody asked me this week, he said, do you think there's anybody in our church that smokes? I said, well, the preacher does. No, not really. I said, well, I know that there's one person that does. I know one person that does. He said, well, what kind of a hypocrite? See, that's why people don't want to let their real feelings out. Because they're afraid people are genuinely I hate that word. That, pray for the preacher that he doesn't use the word genuine anymore. Uh, people are, what's the word for genuine? People are truly afraid that if you found out, if people found out the real you, that they wouldn't love you. So they never get to the point where they feel that they can say what is truly in their heart and on their mind. Women are not so much that way. Women talk. They love to talk. They like to talk. I've told Carol this many times. She can meet, uh, don't, don't talk with ladies, don't talk. No, it's, uh, I've told Carol this before. She can meet somebody, and in five minutes, they're telling her their life story. That's the way women are. Men aren't that way. Men really do not like to let their feelings be known because they are afraid that they will seem vulnerable. People are afraid, really afraid, that if you, that if, if me, 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 that if I said how it is. I really feel. People hold their feelings in. They don't worry about it. Look, the Bible says confess your faults. The Bible says bear ye. How can, you, how can you bear my burdens? How can I bear your burdens? If I don't even know what your burdens are, oh, I'm not going to tell anybody my burdens because then they'll really know what kind of person I am and I don't want anybody to really know what I'm like. Well, Jesus knows what you're like. Look, I hope he's not listening tonight. I know my brother listens to us down in Bristol, if he is. Hey, brother. But, you know, it's like he was, my, my brother was getting married uh, again. He was getting married for a second time. And I, I said to him, I said, I said, brother, I said, did you learn anything from your first marriage? I don't know whether he was being sarcastic or not, but he said, yeah, I'm marrying somebody I love this time. But I said, okay. And then he started crying. And I don't mean he was just, he, he wasn't just teary-eyed crying. He was weeping. He was sobbing. And he said this to me. He said this to me. He said to me, he said, Jim, 
He said, I don't even know if I'm saved. I said, what's the matter? He said, what's the matter, brother? He said, I am so bitter against dad. Now, after he split up with his first wife and went back home and lived, I never suggest a grown kid, you better not even let him in the door. You know, I'm coming home. Oh, no, you're not. You know, it's like, uh, but he went back to live with my dad. And, fellas, if you've ever worked for dad, you know how that can be. I work for my father-in-law, but he said, I am so bitter against dad. He said, I, I don't even know if I'm saved. Now tell me, you be honest. Would you ever get to a place in your life where you would admit that to a fellow believer in Christ? Oh, no, I could never do that, preacher. Preacher, if I did that, then people would really know that, that they would think I'm a hypocrite. No, they wouldn't. They'd think that you were, they'd think you were being honest. They would think that if one of you came to me and said to me, Preacher, I, I need to talk to you because I'm really, really, really bitter. Or, Preacher, I really ha holding, I have a really bad feeling about somebody. Or, Preacher, I, I am, I, I'm not even sure I'm saved. I had somebody come to me. If I told you who it was, you'd be absolutely amazed at who that was. Who came to me and said, Preacher, I'm not even sure I'm saved. Now, we talked, got the situation settled. DJ said something to me today, said something to Doug and I today, that he said, I, the devil must really be attacking me today. And folks, I, I, honestly, I said several weeks ago, as long as your flag's up, the bombs are going to keep flying. You, you just need to be reminded of that. And in this thing about salvation. As long as you're saved, the bomb, devil's going to keep throwing bombs at you about your salvation. He's going to keep throwing them at throw you. Make you doubt. Try to make you doubt. But we're afraid. We are afraid that if we let people really know how we really feel, they wouldn't like us. They wouldn't love us. They wouldn't want to be around us. And the opposite of that ought to be true. That if somebody came here, it came to me and said, Preacher, I, I'm bitter. Preacher, I, I, uh, I have a bad feeling towards someone. And, and we ought not to be bitter against anyone. We ought not to have a bad feeling about anybody. We ought to love everybody. If somebody came to me like that, I said, Brother, let's pray about it. Somebody said to me, Preacher, I got a problem with nicotine. I have a problem with nicotine. What, what am I going to do, laugh at them, make fun of them? We have got to get to a place in our life to that fifth level of communication where we're willing to just say, Preacher, here it is. Or my brother, here it is. Uh, my wife, here it is. My husband, here's how I really feel about it. This is how I really feel about it. I, this is what I feel about it. And not be afraid to let our burdens be known. Not be afraid to let, if I'm going to pray for your faults, I, if, if the Bible says confess your faults, oh, I couldn't confess my faults to somebody. If I confess my faults to somebody, again, they'd think I was a hypocrite. They would think I'm not saved. No, if I'm going to adequately pray for you. In confidence, we may go to a brother or a sister and say, could you please pray for me? See, when we get to that level, when we get to that fifth level, that level of communication where we have total and complete and unbridled freedom to confess our faults or to tell someone. I just, I throw it out to you. We're going to get to Ephesians in a minute. Unfortunately, our time is about gone. Let me ask you a question. Think about it. When's the last time you were, I almost said it, the G word, I didn't say it. When was the last time 
that you went to a brother or sister and you put your arm around them and just said, I love you. Preacher, I couldn't do that. I, I feel funny doing that. Well, I would feel funny if, if you did that to my wife, fellas. I might punch you. But if, when's the last time you went to a brother, brother, to a fellow brother, and said, I want you to know, I really do love you. Oh, I couldn't say that, preacher, because people would think I'm kind of, it, it's like this. Here we are having a prayer meeting, and BJ comes up, puts his arms around Alex to keep him from standing up. Now, on TV, somebody's seeing that, and they're thinking, what kind of a church is that anyway? If we're going to be, if we're going to be real, I'm sorry, if we're going to be real in our Christianity, we're going to be honest. Remember that verse in Ephesians 4, 8, the horse just passed lower Germany. I got it down. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. Um, if we're going to be like that, we've got to get to this place in our lives where we've got to, it's okay to come in and say to Pete, Pete, how are you feeling today? You know, at 80 years old, it's good that he can feel, you know, it's a, we can ask him how he feels. You know what I found with Pete? He and I pray together almost every Wednesday night. He and I pray together. And I know that many of you pray with the same people on Wednesday night. And I'm not saying let's switch up because I like praying with Pete. Because when he and I pray, he is honest when he's praying. He's honest when he's praying. He doesn't hold anything back. He's honest in his praying. Bible in Ephesians chapter 4, those five levels, 80% of people's problems are in, in the communication area because they don't know how to talk. But here's what the Bible, there are five things, five things uh, tonight, I, we're, we're out of time, but there are five things that Ephesians chapter 4 gives us in this area of communication. First one is this found in, in verse 15, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. The first thing, five rules, five rules for effectively communicating with your husband or with your wife or with your friend or with your brother or with your sister in Christ. Five things that we should uh, think about. The first one is found in Ephesians chapter 5, and it says this in verse 15. It says, oh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4, I, you know where I'm at. Ephesians 4 and verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. Number one is this, don't lie. Don't lie to one another. Don't lie to, and, and then it goes on again in verse 25. It says this, again, wherefore putting away lying. Lying, lying. We ought not to lie to one another. If we're going to communicate with one another, it, we've got to know that we can trust one another. I know there are some people that I talk to, I don't believe... If they told me the sun was out and there was a blue sky up there and the sun was out and there was a blue sky up there, I wouldn't believe them. Because almost everything they tell me, they say to me, um, I, I can't believe what they say. Did you, did you ever know anybody like you? I just can't believe a word that comes out of that guy's mouth because they're all the time lying. Just lying all the time. Hear what the Bible says. It says, don't lie. Put away lying. You'll note what it says there. Put off concerning, in verse 22, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Before we were saved, we lied. Some people made a practice of lying. Since we are saved, we ought not to lie one to another. But speak the truth in love. We ought not to lie. One of the rules is don't lie. Don't lie. Where are you going? Uh, uh. Um, I'm going to church. They call over to church and you're not even here. Don't lie. And don't use the church as an excuse either. Don't lie. You're married. Don't lie to one another. Learn to trust one another. That fifth level of, of communication, of freedom, if you're going to trust one another, you need to know that 
that, that other person is not lying to me, but telling me the truth. Now, if you don't want to tell them the truth, if they ask you something and you're not to that level, why well, I just don't feel like I can tell you the truth, don't lie about it. Just tell Mike, I, I, I really do not feel like I can tell you what it is. I don't want you to see the real me or, or whatever it is, but don't lie. Secondly, this, verse 26, don't blow up. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Don't give place. You, what you're doing when you blow up, you need to expect, if you haven't figured this out yet, you need to figure this one out. You need to expect that there may be problems every day. Now, not major problems every day, not divorce court problems every day, but you need to uh, expect that there are going to be problems in your, there could be, not there is going to be, but that there might be problems during the day. And you need to look at it, and you need to be aware of it. <clears> then <throat> you need to understand that when a problem comes, you don't need to blow up. There doesn't need to be an atomic explosion. There doesn't need to be flying saucers going around the kitchen. When, I don't know what happened, I really don't know what happened, I just remember her telling the story. I wasn't, I wasn't very old. My friend Roger, his mother, or Roger told me this, that Roger's father, Mr. Zach, and, and uh, Miss Faye got in a fight, and she threw a knife at him. And fortunately, he had a cowboy belt buckle on, and it hit it and deflected it. Look, you need to understand that there are going to be problems sometimes. Maybe not on a daily basis, but sometimes on a weekly basis. Sometimes on, on a, a, a big problems come up, and you just need to be aware of that. And when they do, I'm not going to blow up. I'm not, I'm not going to blow up about it. Too many times, you know, problems start because something did not go exactly right, and then people blow up. The Bible says in verse 25 or verse 26, be ye angry and sin not. There is a righteous anger. I'm angry over 55 million babies being slaughtered. I'm angry over that. We ought to be angry over that. We ought to be angry the direction our country is going. We ought to be angry. There is a righteous anger. But there is an anger that is not righteous. Be ye angry and sin not. Be ye angry. You can be angry and not sin. But there is an anger that is sinful. So second rule about communicating, if we're going to communicate effectively, is don't blow up. Thirdly this. And verse 28 says this, let him that stole steal no more. Thirdly is this, don't steal one another's time. Don't steal one another's time. Fourthly this, if you'll note in verse 29, verse 29 says this, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. My dad used to say to me, after I said something smart to him, he, he, would, he would get angry at me. The Bible says, children, obey your parents. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents, for this is right the Lord. Children, obey your parents. Whether you like it or not, children, obey your parents. It is not, was that, what is that, that poem? I believe it was by Kipling. It is not for you to reason why, it is but for you to do or die. If your parents tell you to do something, do it. Well, I don't want to do it. Do it anyway. Dad would say something to me, and I would say something back to him, and he would get upset with me, and, and this is what he would say to me. He said, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. With that smart aleck attitude. Yeah, what, when, when, if we're going to communicate properly in our marriages, in our church, with our friends, with our loved ones, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not always what you say. But it's how you say it. Oh, your hair is lovely today. Now, you know that's dripping with sarcasm, and you didn't really mean it. It's not what you always say, but it's how you say it. Be careful about what you say and how you say it and how you are saying it. My boss always says to me, if I tied your hands, you couldn't talk. 
probably. But be careful what you say to one another and how you say it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That which is good to edifying. One of the seven gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the church is that of, of exhortation, an exhorter, somebody who exhorts. Romans chapter 12, look at it sometime. A person who is an exhorter, somebody who is an encourager. We have, we have several people in our church who are encouragers, people who are just encouragers. Uh, you got to be careful how you say things. Because people are very thin-skinned sometimes. Uh, uh, can I, may I say this quickly? Uh, get over being thin-skinned. I mean, come on, just uh, let it go. I don't, I'm not even going to say this. But you, uh, they, they might be. But anyway, uh, don't be thin-skinned. Be careful what you say. Be an edifier. Be able to put your arm around somebody and just tell them, ask them. Jen, no, ask them, how is it going? and mean it. And don't be, well, you got your arm around them looking at your watch to see how long they're taking. Carol reminds me occasionally, don't be like Dr. McKnight. He would come up to you and, hey, how's it going? See you later. Don't do that. Be an edifier. Be an edifier. Be somebody that says something good. The Bible says in Proverbs, I believe it's chapter 12, 12, 25, heaviness in the heart maketh a man stoop, but a good word, a good, but, but uh, a good word, I forget how it goes, but a good word is to edifying, something like that. A good word, a good word. When you talk to somebody, have something good to say to them. You're looking good. If you don't mean it, at least act like you do. You're looking good. I, I'm so glad to see you. you know I am glad to see you. I'm always glad to see you when you're in church. When people aren't here, when you're not here, I miss you. When, you know, when, when Matt and the fam are gone, and, and I know they've got a ministry, I know they're out doing things. I miss it when they're not here. I miss them when they're not here. I, I really do. When Pete Shear has to work and can't make a church, I miss it. And I tell Pete that. I sit with him on Sunday mornings when, it, when he's here. And I, I put my arm around him. And I, I'm, I'm real when I say that I'm so glad to see him. And he looks at me and he says, I love you, preacher. Be genuine. Be an edifier. Build people up. Be an encourager. Fifthly, this. And we're done. If we're going to, if we're going to effectively communicate one with another. You need to have in verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving. Have a spirit of forgiveness. People, look, the Bible says that in, in all things we offend in word. You, you cannot, it's hard sometimes, you're just talking and you say something and you offend somebody. You offend them. I don't like it that you dyed your hair green. You know, you say, well, the, the beautician said it looked good. Yeah, well, it doesn't. Okay, look. One that, remember our three questions. Is it true? Well, yeah, it's true. It's green. Is it kind? Or is, it, is it necessary? Probably. Is it kind? Well, you know it's not kind. If you're going to communicate effectively, you're going to get offended. You are going to get offended. Put it down. You're going to get offended. Now, what you do with that is going to determine your relationship. When, when Mrs. Ward started playing for us, you know me, I'm, I'm kind of sarcastic. and Yeah, I'm kind of sarcastic and and I would say things. And she would go home and she'd get on the landline and she'd start crying to Mrs. Carpenter. No, she didn't really. She'd call Mrs. Carpenter up. Mrs. Carpenter just say to her, he doesn't mean anything by it. He really does. 
He doesn't, he doesn't mind. Now look, you're going to get offended. I did not know that I had offended her. I really did not. I thought she knew that I was a clown. But anyway, she didn't. She could have quit. A lot of people do. I got offended in church. I got offended. I'm not coming back. Well, what happened? Somebody sat in my seat. I'm not coming back. Matt usually sits there. John sits there. Arnold sits there. David Agnes sit right there. If somebody sits in their seat, next Sunday, Pete Fitzgerald sitting in their seat. I'm not ever coming back. He's sitting in my seat. You are going to get offended. What you do with that will determine your relationship. What, all, what should our attitude be? Oh, that's okay. Somebody called me the other day. I called somebody the other day. And in the background, I could hear somebody yelling at the preacher. A few days later, they called up and said, I want to apologize. And I said, for what? Well, I just said some things. Didn't hear it. Didn't hear it. It's okay. I, I accept the apology. I'm not sure what it's for, but let it go. People hang on. You know, it's like that old thing when my wife and I get in an argument, she becomes historical. Don't you mean hysterical? No, historical, because she remembers every fight we ever had and brings it up. You got to let it go. If you get offended, and the Bible says, that you will. And a brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city. If you get offended in your marriage, you're, when, when you first get married, you're pretty stupid. The older you get, you're still pretty stupid. But when you first get married, you're like really stupid. I, I, I said to Carol one time, you don't make biscuits like my mother. Yeah, and then she said, well, you don't do this like daddy. Now, you know what she did? She called up my grandmother, my mother, and found out what she did. You know this. You know this. And, and I'll say this. My wife is the best cook I've ever known in my life. Did she get offended? Well, she probably got her feelings hurt. You may get your feelings hurt. But if you're going to have good communication in our church, guys said, you know, this chicken leg was ordained from the foundation of the world to be eaten by me. And another guy literally grabbed it out of his hand and said, not today. The guy left the church over. Now, it wasn't this church, but it happened. I'm just saying that if you're going to communicate effectively, you have got to have a spirit of forgiveness. And when somebody comes to you and says, I'm sorry that I offended you, about what? I don't, I don't even remember it. I don't remember it anymore. It's over and done with. 80% of problems in marriages are because people don't know how to talk to one another. Five rules for effectively communicating. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. Now, Lord, for this evening, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, that we have had to be here. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, the Bible is just more than anything. It's practical. It shows us how to live. It shows us how to get along. And we thank you for that. Lord, help us to grow in grace. Help us to learn how to effectively talk to one another. Lord, help us to get to the place in our life where we have the freedom to express ourselves and not worry about what other people might think. Because, Lord, we know that they really do love us. Father, again, we thank you for this evening. Lord, I pray that you give traveling mercies. Watch over us as we go to our homes this night. Give, Lord, deer out everywhere. 
looking for something to eat, Lord, trying to eat our cars, evidently, because they're all the time running into them. So, Lord, I pray you'll help us as we go. Just keep us safe. Bring us back Wednesday night, Lord. Look forward to our Wednesday night service, our prayer time. Lord, bless us, we ask, as we go now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.